Hi everyone, Jason here from C-Squared Racing, and welcome to the latest episode in our History of Racing playlist. If you haven't seen the other videos, uh, be sure to check out that playlist. Today, we're going to talk about the Brickyard, uh, a racetrack that's called that because back in 1909, a guy named Carl Fisher had the crazy idea to build a two and a half mile uh, oval speedway in central Indiana and pave it with 3.2 million bricks, just like this one. Uh, this is one of the Culver bricks uh, right here. Uh, most of these bricks are now either paved over or removed from the track, except for a three foot wide uh, strip at the start finish line that everybody now lovingly calls the yard of bricks. Being based in Indianapolis, we've had the pleasure of spending a lot of time at IMS. I also had the honor of partnering with Volunteer Motorsports in 2019 to compete in the longest races in track history, a pair of 10 hour sports car endurance races held on the road course. It was an amazing experience to race on such hallowed ground. Of course, you can't talk about the Indianapolis Motor Speedway without talking about the Indianapolis 500. For over a century, it's been the marquee event at the racetrack, and it's built up quite a long history, but not all of that history is real well known. So we decided to dig a little deeper into some of the lesser known facts about the Indianapolis Motor Speedway and its marquee event. You can't think of the month of May in Indiana without thinking about the Indianapolis 500. Not just a single day event, the race is preceded by a month-long celebration called the 500 Festival. Held since 1957, it includes a breakfast, mini marathon, special memorial service, and a parade. A Grand Prix race on the Speedway's road course, followed up by two weeks of practice and qualifying on the oval, lead into the pomp and circumstance of one of the most spectacular racing events in the world. First held in 1911, there are more stories than we could ever hope to cover in this video but we picked out 10 things you probably didn't know about the Indy 500. If you want to get a glimpse of the drivers and crews up close, away from the track, you may want to try Charlie Brown's Pancake and Steakhouse in Indianapolis. Since the 1970s, it's been a common stopping place for hungry teams, as it's just a short walk from the track. There are a lot of really great restaurants and bars near the track, so if you're in town for a race, be sure to check out some of the local eateries. Just don't interrupt the driver's meal for an autograph, because that's rude. There's lots of great food to be had at the Indy 500, including Indiana's famous pork tenderloin sandwich, but one of the most popular food is the track fries. Fans will consume around 24,000 pounds, or 12 tons, of the track fries on Indy 500 race day. That's around the same weight as two full-grown elephants. Some also say that if you lined up all the dogs, no, not those dogs, hot dogs, and bratwurst sold on race day, that it would circle the track three times. Personally, I still prefer the kebabs. By the way, since the 1930s, peanuts were considered bad luck in racing. The popular legumes were placed at fault for some fatal crashes after shells were found at the crash scenes. Seems nuts, right? Don't worry, recently the concession stands at IMS have begun selling them once again. The Indianapolis 500 isn't actually held in Indianapolis. The race takes place in the tiny town of Speedway, which takes its name from the racetrack. Established in 1912 by the founders of Indianapolis Motor Speedway, the town was intended to be a city without horses, where everyone would drive automobiles. It was also intended to provide homes for workers at Carl Fisher's Presto Light Factory and IMS co-investor James Allison's Allison Engine Company. Today, the town of Speedway, which covers less than five square miles, is home to around 12,000 citizens. Speedway is also the home of the United States Auto Club and the Delara Race Car Factory, where the cars used in the IndyCar series are built. Several Indy 500 races have come to an early end due to rain, but in 1916, the sixth running of the Indianapolis 500 marked the only year that the event was intentionally shortened. While it's common to finish a race in under three hours today, back then the cars were a lot slower. Previous races had lasted over six hours. Worried that spectators were growing bored with such long races, the Speedway's owners decided to shorten the 1916 race to just 300 miles, or 120 laps. British driver Dario Resta won the compressed race, which included only 21 cars. World War I caused the race to be canceled for two years before returning in 1919 along with its traditional 500 mile length. 
Although Resta is the only driver to win an Indy 300, 1995 champion Jacques Villeneuve is often credited with completing the Indy 505. The Canadian was given a two-lap penalty early in the race for passing the pace car, but rallied to victory anyway, having driven an extra five miles more than the rest of the field. In the early days of the Indianapolis 500, cars usually had an additional passenger, a ride-along mechanic. In fact, between 1912 and 1923, they were mandatory for any race over 100 miles in distance. The mechanic didn't just fix the car, he would also manually pump the fuel, watch for traffic, and even sometimes massage the driver's hands. After World War II, most cars were converted to single-seaters, but the role of the ride-along mechanic wasn't officially taken out of the rule books until 1964. In 1981, it took almost five months to declare a winner after a controversial finish to the 65th running of the Indianapolis 500. Bobby Unser crossed the finish line five seconds before Mario Andretti, but after the race, USAC officials determined that Unser had passed cars illegally while exiting the pits during a caution on lap 149. Unser was given a one-position penalty, giving the win to Andretti. Unser and his owner, Roger Penske, challenged the penalty, and on October 9th, he regained his victory. It would be Unser's third and final Indy 500 win. Jules Gou became the first Frenchman to win the Indianapolis 500 in 1913. During the race, Gou and his ride-along mechanic, Emile Began, reportedly consumed four bottles of champagne, with most of it being spit out so as to not become intoxicated during the race. You know, safety first. In 1914, drinking and driving in the race was outlawed. Gu was later quoted as saying, without the good wine, I would have not been able to win. The Indianapolis Motor Speedway is really big. It's so big, several famous landmarks would fit inside the two and a half mile oval, including the Roman Coliseum, the Vatican City, and Churchill Downs, among others. The track's oval encloses 253 acres of land, but the entire facility occupies over a thousand acres in all. IMS holds people too. In fact, it's prepared to host approximately 400,000 fans at a single event, if you count standing room and lawn seating. The track's permanent seating capacity of over 257,000 still makes it one of the largest sporting venues in the world, depending on whose stats you believe. For the 100th running of the Indianapolis 500 in 2016, it's estimated that the track hosted over 350,000 fans, or about the population of the city of Anaheim. That's far beyond the 263,500 reported to have attended the 2015 24 Hours of Le Mans race in France. I was actually at the Indy 500 that year. Here's the view I had from my seat. The first Indy 500 was won by Ray Haroon in 1911. Haroon, a part-time racer and employee at the Marmon Motor Car Company based in Indianapolis, considered himself an engineer above all, and he thought of racing as a way to test his creations. He not only drove the famous Marmon Wasp to victory, but he also designed and built the car. To save weight and go faster, Haroon decided against taking along a riding mechanic like every other driver did in 1911 but that meant he needed another way to deal with the traffic on the racetrack. Several years earlier, Haroon had observed a horse-drawn taxi in Chicago using a mirror to look backwards, and this inspired him to create the first rearview mirror for an automobile. Indianapolis Motor Speedway is known for auto racing, but the first race didn't include a single car. In fact, the first race was between gas-filled balloons. The founder and president of IMS, Carl Fisher, was a fan of aviation, and it was he who organized the event. Fisher and his business partners, James Allison, Frank Wheeler, and Arthur C. Newby, were looking for a way to make back some of their investments into the track. The National Championship Balloon Racing Competition took place on June 5, 1909, more than two months before automobiles would grace the track for the first time on August 19th. Fisher also formed the Aero Club of Indiana, and joined with George Bumbaugh to develop balloons like the Indiana. Fisher and Bumbaugh flew the Indiana together in the historic event. Fisher would later recount the race for the Indianapolis Star newspaper. 
While the military band rent the air with strains of the Star Spangled Banner, and more than 40,000 spectators cheered us to the echo, Captain G.L. Bumbaugh and myself rose from the motor speedway June 5th at about 5 o'clock, nerved to brave whatever obstacle time had in store. Carl Fisher, June 20th, 1909. This is actually the first aerial photograph ever taken of the Speedway. It was taken during a practice flight by Fisher and Bumbaugh on May 22nd, 1909. Well, we couldn't cover all of the history of the Indianapolis Motor Speedway in just one video, but we hope you learned something new and that you gained a greater appreciation for Indy's place in racing history. We strongly suggest that you make a visit to Indy if you haven't been here already. We'd also like to thank our friend Amy for suggesting the topic of this video. And if you have an idea for a topic for a future video, please leave your suggestion in the comments below. Thanks for joining us once again. Take care, and we'll see you on the next lap. <laughs>